A short intellectual history on fascism. Part 1. The Roots of Fascism. A short intellectual history from Hegel to national syndicalism in relation to the development of Italian fascism during the interwar period of the 20th century. From the authoritarian dictatorship of Napoleon Bonaparte and the ideas he helped to spread throughout the absolutist kingdoms of 19th century Europe, various philosophies, political movements, and concepts would come into being. Nationalism, being one of those ideas, would become one of the most powerful and pervasive ideas found in many the minds of a revolutionary. The process of fighting to create a core culture and state became, with some th older theories and offshoots, would help to create a wealth of political and social ideas that would culminate with the creation of totalitarian states that would take hold during the interwar period of the 20th century. The following will illustrate how the ideas of the 19th century contributed to the creation of the arguably first totalitarian ideology, Italian fascism. The following will draw from the intellectual atmosphere of Europe in the years following the French Enlightenment and the French Revolution of the 18th century to the years leading up to the establishment of fascism in Italy under Mussolini during the 20th century. One cannot begin to discuss political dictatorship in the modern era without first passing over those of the 18th and 19th centuries. The justifications for absolute control and authority, along with the divine right of kings, had begun to wane in the wake of the Enlightenment that had been tearing its way ac across Western Europe, especially in Britain and France. The figure of the divine right monarch gave way to the enlightened despot of the late 18th century and early 19th centuries. Napoleon being the prime example. These rulers did not follow the ideas of the Enlightenment, but they used the ideas as a justification for their power, posing as enlightened and benevolent rulers. All political events and wars alluding to the contrary, of course. The last of these rulers was arguably Napoleon Bonaparte, who, during the chaos of the French Revolution, seized the opportunity and mounted the throne of France first as consul, then as emperor of the First French Empire. The massive upheavals during this period, especially during and after the Napoleonic Wars, were caused by the sp spread of French revolutionary and enlightenment ideas to neighboring countries. Neighboring countries that Napoleon had subdued ruffling the feathers of the old regime, though not toppling them completely. The ideas of liberalism and national identity began to be used as justification for liberation and revolution. Seeing this, and the destruction that it brought, the intellectuals of the 19th century began to reflect a notably anti-enlightenment sentiment. These were the roots of 20th century fascism. Literature surrounding fascism as a movement and political ideology does itself credit and its unrelenting honesty about its goals and its worldview, especially concerning Italian fascism. The Doctrine of Fascism, written by Benito Mussolini and Giovanni Gentile in 1932, outlines the cause, causes, and ideology of the fascist movement in Italy. While many of the universals of the fascists are now known, for example, the superiority of the state, militarism, single party, and or single leader dictatorship, etc. There are few who can claim to know the particulars of its philosophy and where they come from, besides opportunism crossed with the bastardization of Nietzsche. A reading of the doctrine of fascism can expel such ignorance of the philosophy and of the movement in general. The pamphlet opens with an outline of the basic ideas surrounding philosophical thought, of the fascist. Quote, like every concrete political conception, fascism is thought and action. Quote, like every concrete political conception, fascism is thought and action. It is action with an inherent doctrine which, arising out of a given system of historic forces, is inserted in it and works on it from within. It has therefore a form co-related to the contingencies of time and place. 
but it has at the same time an ideal content which elevates it into a formula of truth in the higher region of the history of thought. After reading this, it may interest the reader to know that this was a section of the pamphlet that was written by Italian philosopher Giovanni Gentile, who is one of the intellectuals responsible for reviving the philosophy of German idealist philosopher George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. In the above section, displaying the ideology's fundamentals, one sees a clear Hegelian influence. Indeed, the above section is a reflection of Hegel's philosophy of history, i.e., the dialectic. Mussolini and Gentile conceived fascism not only as a political or social force, but as a resultant creation of historical forces that was formed to work for or against something as a historical force within itself. There are yet more indications that Hegel's philosophy had a large impact on fascist philosophy. Hegel addresses the state in a similar term that the fascist does. The fascist views the state as everything, as shown in the following. Quote, For the fascist, all is comprised in the state, and nothing spiritual or human exists, much less has any value, outside of the state. In this respect, fascism is a totalizing concept, and the fascist state, the unification of and synthesis of every value, interprets, develops, and potentiates the whole life of the people." Unquote. Before everything that is conceived in society, there must first be a state to grant an objective identity, at least in accordance with fascist philosophy. To that which exists within the state, that is created, objective identity must be granted for that which exists within the state that is created. As such, the fascists of Italy rejected the decrepit nationalistic concept, quote, rejected the decrepit nationalistic concept which was used as a basis for all the publicists of the national states in the 19th century, unquote. The fascists abided by the notion that all must come from the state. Quote, the nation is created by the state, which gives the people, conscious of their own moral unity, the will, and thereby an effective existence. The right of the nation to its independence is derived not from the literary and ideal consciousness of its own existence, much less from a de facto situation more or less inert or unconscious less from a de facto situation more or less inert and unconscious, but from an active consciousness, from an active political will disposed to demonstrate in its right political will disposed to demonstrate in its right, that is to say, a kind of state already in its pride, in fieri. The state is, in fact, in its right, that is to say, a kind of state already in its pride, in fieri. The state, in fact, as a universal ethical will, is the creator of all right." Unquote. Such assertions scream of Hegel's conception of the state in his 1820 work, Elements of the Philosophy of Right, which makes many of the same points regarding the relationship that the state has with the various aspects of reality, many of which are mirrored in the fascist conception of the state. The following passages from section 3 of the Elements of the Philosophy of Right illustrates those simula similarities in no uncertain terms. The state, quote, the state is the actuality of substantial will, an actuality which it possesses in the particular self-consciousness. This has been raised to its universality. As such, it is the rational in and for itself. This substantial unity is an absolute and unremoved end in itself. And in it, freedom enters into its highest right, just as this ultimate end possesses the highest right in relation to individuals, die, die Endelnen, whose highest duty is the members of the state." Unquote. Quote, but the relationship of the state to the individual, individuum, is of quite a different kind. Since the state is an objective spirit, 
It is only through being a member of the state that the individual, individuum, himself has objectivity, truth, and ethical life. Union as such is itself the true content and end, and the destiny, betis mung, of individuals, individuen, is to lead a universal their further particular satisfaction, activity, and mode of conduct have the substantial and universally valid basis as their point of departure and result." Unquote. In these two sections, the influence that Hegel had on fascist philosophy is quite clear. It makes a great deal of sense considering that Giovanni Gentile was a neo-Hegelian and one of the major forces in neo-Hegelianism in Italy in general. Such a philosophical stance would have a profound effect on Gentile and thus fascism's view of the state and its relationship to society. Hegel, however, is not the only intellectual influence on Italian fascist ideology. While he continues a great deal, he contributes a great deal to the worldview, especially concerning the state, its role in society, and the historical cycle of the dialectic, there is yet more who contribute to the fascist fabric that are of some of importance at least. In the doctrine of fascism, there are whispers of the 19th century existentialist Friedrich Nietzsche. While Nietzsche had less of an obvious influence on Mussolini's Italian fascist ideology than he would on the ideology of, say, the Nazis in Germany, another movement that developed around this time, especially in their twisted conception and interpretation of his Superman, or Ubermensch, the influence of Nietzsche on Italian fascism can be seen near the end of the first section of the pamphlet, where the author is describing what defines people within the state, defining a nation as, quote, a progeny that is rather the outcome of history which perpetuates itself, a multitude unified by an idea embodied in the will to have power and to exist, conscious of itself and of its personality." Unquote. Here one sees a take on Nietzsche's concept of the will to power, which itself was taken by Schopenhauer's will to live, or der Will zur Macht, the will to power. The goal of the fascists to embrace, possess, and use power violently to bring about the next historical epoch, and in a purely non-Nietzschean view, help to establish or continue to define the national identity of the nature of people, there are less obvious murmurs of Nietzsche's philosophy placed throughout, such as a qualitative standard for man in terms of government formation, thus disenfranchising the quantitative standard that justifies democracy, a view of Nietzschean elitism, Nietzsche makes his point clear on democracy, saying that it is, quote, to be not merely an abased form of political organization, but rather an abased, more specifically a diminished, form of humanity, a mediocritization, depreciation of humanity and value. Where do we need to reach with our hopes? Unquote. This view is reflected in the doctrine of fascism. Quote, the state is not merely either the numbers or sum of individuals forming a majority of the people. Fascism, for this reason, is opposed to democracy, which identifies peoples with the greatest numbers of individuals and reduces them to a majority level. But if people are conceived, as they should be, qualitatively instead of quantitatively, then fascism is democracy in its purest form." Unquote. This view of authoritarian rule is reflected in many other fascist movements during the 20th century, forming its basic definition later on. Such justifications of authoritarian rule and force were arguably Nietzsche's greatest contribution to the fascist movements as a whole, not only in Italy, but also to Germany and its take on fascism, that being Nazism. This will not be the last that we hear of Nietzsche, as he had a much more profound effect on Nazi ideology and such. Uh, he will be discussed at length in part two of this series. 
Italian fascism was, by Mussolini's own evaluation, a right-wing movement. He and Gentile viewed fascism through a Hegelian lens, as shown above, heralding fascism as the antithesis of the 19th century, which he viewed as essentially of socialism, liberalism, democracy, and of the individual. He saw fascism as being the doctrine for and of the 20th century, and was not an effort to turn back the clock to some long-lost golden age as is usual with most forms of traditionalism or conservatism. It stands to reason, then, fascism was not a typically right-wing ideology, aside from its rejection of left-wing ideas and ideals, much, many of which, at least at that point, were uh, heralded by the 18th and 19th centuries, those being the Enlightenment struggles for democracy and republicanism, and the 19th century with uh, free economies and such. While it rejected the ideas of the French Enlightenment, and the historical materialism of class struggle in, of, as popularized by Marx and Engels, so too did Italian fascism reject the society of the old regime, that being the absolutist dictators and rulers of the previous centuries, beginning with the age of colonialism. Mussolini states the following damnation of such things in the second part of the doctrine of fascism. Quote, the fascist negation of socialism, of democracy, of liberalism, should not lead one to believe that fascism wishes to push the world back to where it was before 1879, the date accepted as the opening year of the demo-liberal century. One cannot turn back. The fascist doctrine has not chosen de maestre for its profit. Monarchical absolutism is a thing of the past, and so it is the worship of church power. Feudal privileges and divisions into impenetrable castes with no connection between them are also have-beens. The conception of fascist authority is nothing in common with the police. A party that totally rules a nation is a new chapter in history." Unquote. The given quote shows that Italian fascism was idealized as the antithesis of the thesis for the ideas of the 19th century offering ideas to combat them while serving as a violent force needed to bring the people of Italy into the future. It did not fight to bring back some nebulous vision of a golden age, or to maintain the status quo like the right wing does in its normal conception. Italian fascism was right wing in respect to the bromide, your enemies will define you, i.e., it was the antithesis of what was considered left wing. This goes to show that fascism was in itself a reaction, in both the normal sense and political sense, towards the ideas of the entire 19th century, with all of its advances and vices in individualistic liberty and socialist theory. While the long-term roots of fascist ideology appear as early as Hegel and with the other early German idealist and romantic philosophers, there were also a, a more immediate cause that created the conditions for fascism. Conditions that would create a toxic alliance between the collectivist and economic views of socialism, together with the views of the state and nation that was intrinsic to European nationalism. During the early 20th century, various groups of socialists and syndicalists in Italy sought to bring about a revolution. Without a strong proletarian interest as the agent of revolution, the syndicalists began to make uh, pacts and began to mingle with Italian nationalists, creating a synthesis now known as uh, national syndicalism, a group that applied the tactics and interests of both, fighting for a nationalist revolution. This synthesis was the most immediate and direct route of fascism as a political movement, and was the home of Mussolini during his days as an activist. During these formative years, the nationalist tendencies began to assert themselves over the national syndicalists. This would become more apparent when the Great War broke out in Europe, in, with Italy joining in on the fighting as on the side of the Triple Entente, or with the Allies, 
1915. During the initial years of the war, the internationalist and Marxist elements that remained within the national syndicalist movement finally began to give way to a kind of uh, national socialism. Movements that would eventually become Italian fascism under Benito Mussolini by 1919 came from these various groups. As Mussolini states in The Doctrine of Fascism, after the war in 1919, socialism was already dead as a doctrine. It existed only as a grudge. In Italy especially, it had only one possibility of action, reprisals against those who had won the war and must now pay its penalty. The Popolo d'Italia, carried as the subtitle Daily of Ex-Servicemen and Producers, and the word producers was already then the expression of a turn of mind. Fascism was not the nursling of a doctrine previously worked on on a desk. It was born of the need for action, and it was action." Unquote. As Mussolini said, the nationalist tendencies that were strengthened during the war became even sharper during the early interwar period in light of the hardships that the Italian people, especially former military men, experienced at the behest of the Italian government, its lack of action or its actions elsewhere. The resentment towards the suffering of Italian interests by the Allies, as well as the hardships of the early interwar period, made it much easier for fascism to take root and to seize power as the first totalitarian regime of the 20th century. The fascist movement in Italy did not develop in an intellectual vacuum. Despite the noticeable indifference to doctrine in favor of opportunism, as many dictatorships do, or to put it romantically, a doctrine of action, one cannot ignore the movement's philosophical roots. It is one of the keys to truly knowing the origins of the fascist and totalitarian regimes of the 20th century, which had its roots stretching back almost a century beforehand in the malaise of romanticism and idealism. Fascism was a powder keg that remained inert, its payload slowly growing in volume and pressure until the spark of World War I finally set it off. End of part one. I would like to thank the listener to this first YouTube video. Uh, I, I plan to have this video be the first part of a series going over the developments of some authoritarian dictatorships that developed in the early 20th century in hopes of maybe getting people to say fascist a little bit less. Um, I find that people use fascism a, a great deal more and oftentimes don't even know what it means. So at that point, one should at least know what fascism is, uh, at least in, in the context of, of the movements of the early 20th century, and uh, so I decided that I should make this as my first video. This first video is a reading of an academic paper that I wrote a few months back for a, a class in European Revolution and Nationalism. It covered the years following um, 1789 with the French Revolution and ended with the German and Italian unifications of the late 19th century. So I, I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, the next video should come out in about a month. Uh, you know, all, all things considered, uh, I don't know how busy I am going to be this summer, but, um, you know, just mark that on your calendar, being being about a, a month, at least. Uh, part two will be covering uh, German Nazism, and, um, and the third part will be covering uh, British hyper-nationalism, uh, the, the, uh, the British fascist movements. Uh, during the 1930s and into the 1940s. Um, afterwards, uh, I believe that, by that point at least, I'm going to be in my next year of college, and I'll be taking a class on American Nazism. So, expect to see content concerning uh, American neo-Nazis and things like that. Um, so, this is the, the, first, the first video of... of the mockery of Voltaire channel. I expect to see a lot of things related to history, especially in a political context, and um, 
if you if you have any requests for anything that you want me to cover I can cover it in uh, you know a, a short time at least a page long paper fully annotated bibliography if you wish uh, and I will post both videos and uh, and the paper to both both YouTube and minds.com um, I apologize for my lack of narration and video making skills um, I assume that those things will continue with time uh, will continue to progress and to grow um, but again thank you uh, like and subscribe